Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Um, if you have any questions during this presentation, can you please email them to Robin? Her email address is listed on the PowerPoint in front of you, and it's also in the summary of the video if you need to refer to it later in the presentation. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Michael. Hi, this is Michael Swack from the Carsey School of Public Policy at the University of New Hampshire. And uh, the presentation today is Perspectives on the Future of Community Development of the community development finance industry. I should start with a, a disclaimer, and uh, the disclaimer is that uh, some of the views, all of the views expressed here will, will be mine. Hopefully the views will be based on uh, the data and research we've collected over the last three years or so. So during this presentation, I will pause for, for questions and comments. Uh, you can feel free to send an email if you have comments to uh, uh, Robin Husledge, her email is on the screen right now. Uh, and if you are on a Google interface, it will pop up and I'll see it myself. So feel free to, um, to send questions. Much of the material that I'm uh, presenting here and some of the conclusions I draw are from three studies we've done here at CARSI over the last three years. Uh, an industry analysis that we finished a few years ago that looked at the financial performance of CDFIs. And again, our database for this was uh, all CDFIs that were certified CDFIs and had submitted information to the CDFI fund. An impact analysis this past spring in which we reviewed uh, both financial performance and looked at social impact and how that was measured. And again, used uh, the CDFI database as well as a number of interviews. And that was released uh, this spring. And finally, a report we did for the GIN, the Global Impact Investment Network, on uh, scaling U.S. community investment, the investor product interface, which was just released uh, two weeks ago. All three of these reports are available on our website and can be downloaded. Uh, so perspectives on the future of community development finance industry uh, reminds me a little of uh, a quote from the recently departed Yogi Berra. And Yogi Berra, when uh, asked about the future, commented that, uh, well, things are really hard to predict, especially if they're in the future. So I'm going to make some uh, comments and maybe some predictions, but realize that uh, they may or may not be right. But in some ways, it's a, a way of getting us to look at, at issues which uh, we're beginning to address in the community development finance field right now. Uh, so we're going to look at performance uh, of CDFIs. We're going to look at new initiatives in the field, and we're also going to look at concerns that the CDFI field may have, uh, issues that they're facing now and will be facing in the relatively near future, and how those might be addressed. I want to start with a story. Uh, many of you who uh, have heard me talk before know that I typically do this. Some may have heard this story, in fact. Um, but here we go. So broccoli or potatoes? And this will make sense, I hope, by the end of the presentation. I teach in a master's program for adult practitioners, uh, many of whom work for community-based organizations, community development organizations, uh, CDFIs. And it's a program that's a very applied program. It's a short-term residency program. Uh, I'll mention something about it at the end of this presentation. And um, the uh, particular story I want to tell has to do with a student I had maybe about 20 years ago uh, from the state of Maine. Now, part of the requirement in the master's program is you do a project in your own community, typically with the organization that you're from. And this uh, particular student lived and worked in the state of Maine. And he was doing some work with uh, the Maine Department of Agriculture. This was around the time of the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement uh, going into effect. And um, one of the things that the Department of Agriculture noted was that uh, potatoes, which were one of the main uh, important parts of their agricultural uh, industry in, in Maine, that, that sales were declining. and. Uh, and the work that he did, the, they found that sales were declining actually for two specific reasons. Uh, first of all, there were now more imports 
uh, from Canada. And some people considered potatoes, for example, from uh, Prince uh, Edward Island to be of, of higher quality than Maine potatoes. Well, you could have an argument about that, but that was one of the things that he heard. And the second was that people were just not eating as many potatoes as they used to. In fact, uh, you know, it was seen as not necessarily a, a, a healthy food. There was more of a focus on, on healthy eating. And uh, in fact, the sales were declining and that was tied to the fact that the demand was slackening. And as part of his project, he was trying to look at how could he work with local farmers to uh, address this problem of, of declining sales and declining income for the farmers. And uh, after doing some research and they uh, Cooperative Extension did uh, uh, soil studies and the rest and looked at uh, market analysis, uh, they came up with the idea that actually farmers based on climate, soil and demand in the marketplace should be growing broccoli rather than potatoes. And he was going to give a presentation for these findings uh, in, in Augusta, the state capital. He invited me to join him. So I drove up to uh, Augusta and uh, arrived uh, uh, just a few minutes late. The program had just started. I snuck into the last row and sat next to um, uh, someone who was pretty obviously a, a farmer there for the, the presentation. And uh, you know, I say pretty obviously because I, I had actually, uh, as a child, <laughs> uh, my father grew up on a farm. His brother continued to run the farm. This was in, in, uh, in Ohio. And uh, they used to send me every summer to sort of build my character by working hard on the farm for a while. And, uh, you know, so I sort of knew the, the calluses on the hand, that sort of thing. And I sat in the back row and we listened to the presentation. A presentation I thought was uh, quite good and sort of pre PowerPoint, but they'd made these really nice posters and shown uh, arrows with the declining demand and the arrow going down for potatoes and broccoli, the arrow going up and showing the market studies and all that. And in the conclusion, after showing that uh, the soil tests were favorable for broccoli, uh, they concluded that Maine farmers should switch from potatoes to broccoli. And uh, at the end of the presentation, again, quite well done, uh, they asked for questions. And there was that sort of dead silence, no real questions. And they added on, well, cooperative extension, we'll, we'll work with you, uh, we'll, we'll help you uh, in terms of, you know, getting the seeds and soil preparation information on, on how to do this uh, and, and we'll make it go as smoothly as possible. And I turned uh, to the guy next to me and I said, so um, what did you think of the presentation? He paused for a minute and then he said to me, you know what I'd do if I won a million dollars in the lottery? And I thought, well, maybe he zoned out during the presentation, but you know, I was polite to him and all. And I said, no, well, no, what, what would you do if you won a million dollars in the lottery? And he said, well, I'd keep growing potatoes until I ran out of money. Well, you're probably wondering what does this have to do with uh, community development finance and, and CDFIs? I will get back to that. But the idea is it's difficult to change particularly if you think that what you're doing right now works for you. Let me quickly just look at, most of you are probably familiar with this, but the basic CDFI economic model. And so you have um, uh, uh, sources of capital and users of capital. Regulatory motivated investors would be your banks that are complying with CRA. Mission motivated investors would, could be private individuals. Uh, uh, private foundations through program related investments, policy motivated investors, government agencies like the CDFI fund, uh, the Federal Home Loan Bank. Uh, and these are all investors in uh, community development financial institutions who in turn are intermediaries that lend to borrowers and customers. So that's the basic model like any financial institution. CDFIs charge uh, interest and fees, try to cover their costs, become uh, self-sustaining financial institutions. Uh, again, as many of you know, there are a number of CDFI institution types. Uh, so there are community development banks, credit unions, community development loan funds, venture capital funds. And um, I'm not going to go over this chart in, in, in great detail. Most of you are familiar with this. And uh, this will be posted on our webpage for those who'd want to refer back to it later. 
But essentially, there are these different institution types, which are somewhat different in terms of their capitalization structure, how they're regulated, and uh, which sectors they serve. And increasingly, we see quite a few assets controlled by CDFIs. And again, we tried to break it down here by uh, total asset size by CDFI type. And, and you can see that there's a substantial amount of money uh, uh, in various types of CDFIs uh, throughout the United States, from very small CDFIs, uh, in some instances, loan funds of just several hundred thousand dollars, to institutions that are in the billions. So we see quite a, a range in terms of the asset size uh, by even within each CDFI type in particular. So what have we learned over the past uh, several years? Well, let me start by talking about uh, the good news. And there's actually quite uh, a bit of good news. Uh, uh, CDFIs have performed well. I mean, one of the things that we found is, is we tried to answer the question, have CDFIs fulfilled the legislative mandate that was created when the CDFI fund was created, that was established when the CDFI fund was, was created? And uh, essentially we found that they have, that is CDFIs have learned how to manage risk and lend effectively in areas that mainstream financial institutions typically don't. Uh, and so they have had lending in poorer communities, in lower income communities, with very good portfolio performance. Uh, we've seen over the years, the 20 plus years since the CDFI fund was created, and there were CDFIs before that as well, that very few organizations have gone under because of financial performance, and many of them have very strong performance. In fact, when we look at strength of performance, uh, I was with uh, Dan Latendra from Bank of America last week and in a presentation he gave, he talked about that in fact CDFIs, and they serve CDFIs in 50 different states, uh, lend CDFIs in 50 different states, that over the last five years, uh, CDFI performance, uh, looking at uh, return on assets, has been greater than one and better than banks in every one of the last five years. Return on assets is typically seen as the, the gold standard in terms of uh, financial performance of banking, of banks. So CDFIs have performed quite well. They manage risk, they lend where others don't, uh, and they uh, get good performance, meaning uh, relatively low delinquencies and, and defaults. So that's really good news. They, they've essentially done what they're supposed to do. As I mentioned, uh, their lending is concentrated. We in our impact analysis looked at where loans were made, compared them to where bank loans were made using uh, CRA data from the banks, but then also using uh, the uh, data uh, that the CDFI fund had where you have to, CDFIs, many of you out there are familiar with it, have to report transaction level data. And you're probably wondering, did anyone ever look at this? And the answer is, yeah, we looked at it. <laughs> and, uh, and what we found was that uh, in fact, CDFIs are concentrating their lending activity in census tracts with, with high poverty. Uh, we've also seen that the industry has grown substantially. We looked at growth rates over uh, a period of 10 years, and that in fact, they're increasing in terms of uh, assets managed, uh, leveraging investment from both other public sector and private sector, and even, even increase their lending during the recession uh, uh, and after the recession. Uh, unlike the banking industry in which uh, certain types of lending, particularly business lending, declined uh, quite substantially. And so again, what we see here is that there's very good news about the sector. But you see now this one is more news. And, and part of what we want to reflect is that although the sectors had very good performance, there are issues that are affecting uh, CDFIs and also issues that are coming up that, that may affect them in the future. And so you know, one of the things, uh, again, many of you out there are familiar with this, that CDFIs appear to struggle to meet uh, market needs for longer term loans. That is, your customers are demanding longer term loans, but it's very difficult to access long term fixed rate financing. A number of the in the industry have, have worked to try and address this for a long time. And there are other examples we'll talk about. Uh, OFN, the Opportunity Finance Network, a, a trade association, has uh, done a lot of work to address this, for example, through the, the bond program where they uh, successfully helped uh, 
it established through the CDFI fund a, a bond program that provides long-term fixed rate financing and it was getting out into the sector. But for many CDFIs, accessing this type of money uh, continues to be uh, an issue for them. Also, it's very difficult to measure impact. And, and in fact, we found that it, it was difficult to say what social impact had been because there are many different missions that CDFIs, different impacts that they're trying to achieve and very few standard measures that they use. That is CDFIs and understandably tend to uh, measure more uh, outputs than outcomes. We know how many loans, we know default and delinquency rates. It's often difficult to measure how people who receive those loans are better off. And again, because there are diversity of missions and product types uh, uh, and typically not shared impact measurements, even within those products, it's very difficult to tell what particular outcomes are being achieved. Let me stop for a minute and see if there are any questions. Uh, again, you can send those to Robin, or if you're on Google, you can type them in and they'll pop up. Uh, seeing we don't have any right now, let, let me move on. So you know in the titles are good news, more good news than more news, we have the maybe not so great news. And the maybe not so great news is, uh, now let me uh, identify a few issues. When we first started our, our, our first study, one of our hypotheses was, well, in places where CDFI lenders are active and have demonstrated that they can effectively manage risk and make loans that are repaid, this will encourage other lenders, particularly mainstream lenders, to understand that maybe the risk was perceived risk rather than actual risk and that, that they would increase their lending. Uh, unfortunately, we found that wasn't true. And again, I, I was sure that would be true and was quite surprised when it turned out not to be true. And, uh, and so when we found that those data, I made a few calls, including I made a call to uh, Don Hinkle-Brown, some of you may know is the, uh, the head of, C of um, uh, in Philadelphia of the reinvestment fund, TRF. And I asked Don, what, you know, why, why were we wrong? It seems reasonable. And, and what Don told me is, well, you're about 10 years behind the times, Michael. You know, 10 years ago, you would have been right, but, but it's not right anymore. And the reason it's not right anymore is because the banks that used to compete with us and have similar products, they're gone. The, the banking industries become more consolidated and the banks that are still involved in community development lending are more comfortable lending through us as an intermediary than doing the type of lending that we do. And so one of the things that we found is that CDFI lending does not appear to have attracted mainstream lending. And in many of the areas we observed, in fact, there was significant decrease in mainstream lending in those communities and for the product types offered by CDFIs. And so this is really a problem because the CDFI sector, notwithstanding the numbers I gave you earlier, is a very, very tiny part of the overall capital market. And the loss of bank lending has been significant in many CDFI targeted communities. The second issue we found is that within the CDFI industry, there were many distinctions. That is, there were significant scale effects in all sectors of the CDFI industry, whether you're talking about loan funds or credit unions or banks. And in fact, what we found was substantial amount of evidence that larger CDFIs by almost any measure we looked at were more efficient, meaning they had lower combined interest rates and operating expenses, higher deployment rates, which you might not guess, lower charge-offs, uh, generally in measures of impact that we could look at, um, the larger ones did better. And uh, in fact, what we find is, is that uh, uh, the field is, is quite uh, bifurcated, that uh, uh, there are uh, a certain number of high performing, and again, I mentioned earlier, they're close to a thousand certified CDFIs now. Uh, and then there's a relatively small group, I'd be hard to say by number, but a relatively small group of, of high performing CDFIs. Again, when we, we looked at uh, certain numbers as they got higher in each of the categories of CDFI, again, we found uh, a significant and distinct differences in all of these measures on the basis of uh, uh, of, of size. There are certainly advantages to being bigger. It's so a question that just came in. Uh, let me read it. Is there an effort to create metrics or measures that do address the CDFI sector 
I would have thought that the Financial Innovations Roundtable would have tackled the need for shared measures and metrics. Uh, the Financial Innovations Roundtable is an annual event uh, that we sponsor that uh, uh, typically takes on a particular issue each year and often follows up with additional applied work or, or research to address that. And uh, the answer is that, that we've struggled with that. We actually did have a Financial Innovations Roundtable that, that looked at some of those issues and made some recommendations. And in fact, there has been some progress in terms of trying to standardize definitions. So for example, looking at uh, the issue of as simple as what is a job? And what we saw is that CDFIs uh, measure it differently. Uh, so we don't know, for example, when someone counts a job as a, a, a social benefit, is it full-time or part-time? Does it include benefits? Is it uh, above minimum wage? Is it seasonal? So there are all sorts of issues. There are CDFIs now that have begun to define what a job is and say that they finance good jobs and they have a definition based on some of those characteristics I just mentioned, but there's not an overall standard uh, uh, for the field, nor one that, for example, the CDFI fund applies in looking at, at, at impact. Uh, again, there are different uh, um, uh, trade associations. There's uh, ARIS that also does the evaluation of, of, of CDFIs, uh, uh, the old CARS now called ARIS, uh, in which they also look at social impact. But again, they tend to look at it in terms of the specific uh, uh, outputs and outcomes of that particular CDFI. So there's still work to be done in terms of standardizing definitions and, and measures in terms of social impact within the system. Let me touch a little bit more on these larger CDFIs being more efficient and, and having uh, better metrics in, in just about everything that, that's measured. Why, why is that important? I've mentioned this in, in some of the talks I've given and, uh, you know, often one of the first accusations is, well, you just don't like small CDFIs. Well, you know, as you can see from this slide, that's obviously not true. But what is true is, is that there are hundreds of CDFIs that are marginal make very few loans, often have low deployment rates. If you look at applications to the CDFI fund, what you'll often see is that, that uh, detracts from certain applications is that certain uh, typically smaller CDFIs will apply for CDFI funding, and yet uh, uh, they'll have deployment rates as low as uh, 20 or 30 percent. And, and often the reviewers and the fund will say, well, you know, why do you need more money? You're not using what you have right now. But again, as we get into the, the business model argument, the fact that there are a thousand of them, but many of them are very marginal, struggle to get money out on the street, struggle to uh, uh, raise their operating costs each year is, is of concern to the industry because it means that you have very high performers and very low performers. And uh, uh, this is across all the different CDFI types and across the geography. So for example, one can't say that uh, you know, well, this is a function of, of population because you have very successful CDFIs that uh, uh, have grown quite a bit that operate in, in rural areas where there's not a great population density. And you also have very small ones in high density areas. So there's no particular explanation in terms of geography or, or, or size or anything like that. Let's look at some of the challenges then facing the, 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 the range of, of of, uh, of CDFIs and, and some uh, uh, new developments that I want to talk about in terms of uh, uh, looking at the future. One of the new developments is, is uh, uh, technology, uh, of which online lending is, is, is just one. And um, CDFIs are beginning to look at, this is a topic of our most recent Financial Innovations Roundtable and some research that we're undertaking right now, which is how can CDFIs, really two questions, Number one, better take advantage of technology that would allow them to serve their customers more quickly, perhaps cut their operating costs by using technology. It can be anything from having an online application, which many CDFIs already have, to actually developing a, a, an algorithm that would cut down on, on uh, uh, the amount of time it would take you to make a decision. Uh, and there are issues around, can you, uh, cut costs by using that as well and get money more quickly into the hands of your customers. Uh, there have been a couple initial 
uh, uh, partnerships formed. One is the Opportunity Fund, a CDFI, formed a partnership with Lending Club, which is an online uh, lending platform uh, in which uh, this collaboration will provide for $10 million worth of loans to 400 small businesses in California. So it, it, it's a start, uh, and yet there's a lot more to be done. Most CDFIs are still asking the question, how might technology help us? Can we cut our costs? Can we serve more borrowers? Can we get the word out more? And one of the troubling elements of the field now is, is that many of the online lenders, like OnDeck and Lending Club, and there are quite a few of them, are very aggressively pursuing our customers. And we've seen a number of examples of customers who would normally be seen as customers of CDFIs uh, being uh, picked by uh, 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 some of these online lenders. And not that that in itself is a problem, but often uh, the terms and conditions under which these loans are made, are made are unfavorable. We looked at some where interest rates were charged in excess of 80%, where accounts were cleared by the online lender on a daily basis, and, and the uh, uh, borrowers weren't aware of this. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, uh, for companies to take advantage. So it's really important when we look at technology to look at where can we effectively work with uh, different partners? Uh, how can we effectively use uh, uh, the technology and the online platforms to better serve our customers? That is to cut our costs, create efficiencies, get money out fast, while at the same time still maintaining the level of performance that CDFIs have established over time. Uh, so we're beginning to see some experiments, but it's a broader question that the field faces. How do we utilize technology, for example, in the form of these online platforms to do our job better, to serve more people, uh, to serve them at a, at a fair price, and to do it more efficiently? So this is one of the things that we need to look at and, and look at carefully because, frankly, there are predatory lenders out there and uh, the regulators are beginning to look at what sort of regulations should govern some of the online lenders. Again, like all fields, there are some that are uh, very honest uh, companies that do good work and others uh, tend to exploit their borrowers. The GIN study we just finished really looked at the question of the investor product interface, that is how can we get more investors, uh, both institutional and, and individual investors, to invest in community development, to invest in CDFIs, uh, specifically in community development more broadly. And what we found was, was really quite interesting, and, and that is uh, there remains this mismatch between what investors want and, and what community development lenders and, uh, offer. And uh, what we found is, is what we would call probably the look and feel argument. That is, what investors told us, and this is, an, we spoke to many investment managers. Again, the report is available online, and you'll see the number of investor uh, uh, advisors we talked to, investment managers. And again, what consistently we learned was that it's too hard to do, that uh, the products don't have the look and feel, uh, they can't be bought and sold online. There's no system for distribution that compensates brokers uh, or advisors for, for advising uh, CDFIs. And, and uh, individual investors are potentially a game changer, but we haven't really figured out how to reach them effectively. And uh, uh, in terms of look and feel, uh, investors are used to instruments where they can go online and execute a trade easily and get their money out when they want it. And what uh, investment advisors are telling us, that that's not what community development lending looks like. It's too expensive. Uh, the information and transaction costs are, are very high. Uh, they often don't feel qualified to uh, evaluate uh, what those are. And so that begins to uh, uh, create a problem. And again, uh, the, this opportunity, I think, is important because we do see uh, a variety of external forces, uh, such as waning bank involvement, I talked about that earlier, uh, competition from international development, uh, and even competition from uh, what we call green investment, where there are a number of green investment funds that are really fairly typical uh, securities, uh, uh, debt and equity securities that are bought and sold online, and, and yet uh, impact investors can, can uh, 
can make investments in the same way that they do any other investments and have a quote green portfolio. That's very difficult to do in, in the community development space. One of the things that we propose and are going to be looking at more is this idea of creating a mutual fund where there is liquidity. Essentially, this would be securitized notes of a number of CDFIs in a pooled fund that would you know, have to set up, there are securities issues that have to set a price daily, but uh, it have to have a liquidity reserve. But the question is, can we develop more products that have the look and feel while still maintaining the mission and serving the needs of CDFIs? If we can, uh, we feel that there are tremendous opportunities uh, to reach individual investors, many of whom told us that, that, uh, uh, that their uh, investors are interested. So if you look at this quote here from uh, Joe Keefe, president and CEO of PAX World, uh, he told us that uh, uh, he thought there would be tremendous opportunity here, even when he looked at his investors. And he says, we will continue to do one-off notes where they're available, but if community investing is going to be accessible, a larger response to the liquidity securitization dilemma is in order. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, typical of the response we saw. And so again, there have been efforts in the past to try and address this. Many of you are uh, familiar with uh, Calvert, which uh, does many of things, these things and does a good job. But Calvert is, is right now uh, by itself in the field uh, and, and simply not the only solution. There are more solutions, for example, where you could look at a mutual fund of CDFIs that would focus just on business lending or, or housing. There, there are different funds that could be put together in which they would look at a common set of characteristics. So looking forward, uh, uh, this is a, a real opportunity. Question that we got is, uh, person writes, my larger question is, should the focus be on making CDFIs mainstream or continuing to view the sector as innovators and in upstream CED practices, such, in using, such as using online technology to innovate or expand? And again, uh, uh, as in all of these, the, the, the answer is often both. That is, you know, one of the, some of the data that we looked at, and, and again, in, in a, a, a talk on a panel I, I gave with uh, uh, Dan Latender recently, he again mentioned his concern about increasingly the over-reliance on, on more government sources and, and less private sources. That in fact, the CDFIs he works with, that a significant number of them uh, are involved, for example, in pre-funding uh, uh, government investments, charter schools, health centers, multifamily housing, where the CDFI has understood uh, you know, what the future cash flows from government funding are uh, and in, he said in many of the portfolios of, of his funds, 75% uh, of their lending is, is lending pre-funding government money. So in response to that question, yes, we want CDFIs to use technology to continue to innovate, but we also want them to make it easier by adopting certain types of tools that our investors are familiar with, not to change the way they underwrite or who they lend to, but to be able to access uh, larger sums of money where there are specific restrictions. And again, we've seen uh, uh, recently a, a couple CDFIs have gone to get uh, ratings from Standard & Poor's. Again, TRF just sent out uh, uh, their newsletter, uh, I think it was today even, in which they announced that they got a double A rating from Standard & Poor's. There have been a couple others recently that have gotten ratings as well. And this is an attempt to be able to attract mainstream investors who uh, in some cases, like pension funds, require an investment grade in order to invest. So again, my answer to that question is both. We need to do both. We need to create instruments that are uh, uh, effective instruments to attract mainstream investors, both individual and institutional, while continuing to innovate and, and, and using technology to allow us to do that as well. A uh, couple other Opportunities I, I want to mention, um, partnerships with hospitals and hospital systems. Uh, many of you are familiar with the community benefit provision. It's often called the CRA for hospitals. And uh, we've seen increasingly hospitals are looking at not only how to invest their community benefit money, uh, uh, which is important, uh, but also how to invest their investment portfolios. Uh, many hospital systems throughout the United States have substantial investment portfolios and the ability to direct that money in communities they serve towards housing development, renovation, uh, food, uh, uh, 
child care, small business, uh, you see the, the list there. Uh, and so we believe there are opportunities. We're holding a series of meetings across the country. We recently had one in Chicago, another coming up in Boston, where we're introducing people who, from hospital systems to CDFIs and saying, look, there are partnership opportunities. Uh, the first one was in Chicago a couple of weeks ago, and just really excellent discussions and uh, 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 ideas on how they could collaborate. Uh, so we're looking at uh, how local partners can be engaged. Uh, we're looking at how hospital systems through their investment portfolios as well as their community benefits fund, funds can scale up and diversify investments. And there are some uh, very good examples of, of this going on right now. Uh, Dignity Health was one of the participants in the Chicago conference. Dignity Health uh, uh, just recently committed another hundred million dollars from their investment portfolio. And by the way, we, we, we often think that hospitals are, are, are poor or losing money. The fact is many of the large hospital systems uh, are doing well and, and in fact sit on substantial portfolios. Dignity Health, for example, and Trinity Health, another that participated in our recent meeting, both reported that they had uh, investment portfolios in excess of $8 billion. That's $8 billion. And so agreeing to commit $100 million is, is a relatively small amount. Uh, I, of course, had the nerve to ask the question, well, why not commit the whole $8 billion? And of course, we got the response about what the treasurer and financial officers would say. But in fact, what they're saying is if we can demonstrate that this can be done effectively, these portfolios will grow. And so we believe looking forward that, that hospital systems uh, align with CDFIs and their desire to improve uh, community health. Uh, and that community health is not simply a matter of seeing a doctor. It's uh, eating the right food. It's uh, having uh, uh, housing that's uh, safe housing uh, uh, and that, that's affordable. Uh, so again, aligning these missions uh, with hospital systems we think is an important uh, an important potential source of collaboration and investment funds for CDFIs in the future. And uh, we'll be, we have a, a preliminary report on this from a Financial Innovations Roundtable. It's on our website now. And over the next year, we'll be coming up with a, a follow-up report based on what we've learned from these series of uh, convenings that we're hosting. But again, something to look at in terms of your own community and your own neighborhood. Perspectives on the future, let's keep an eye, our eye on. That means <clears throat> there are some things that we should be concerned about in terms of restrictions that change relationships between investors and, and CDFIs. And some of the big money has, has uh, addressed these issues. So for example, the loss of the concept of parapasu or equal footing. This refers to most CDFIs have policies that uh, their investors have equal rights of, of payment or, or, or access to repayment, equal seniority. So you're investing in a pool and if, should, if there should be losses, uh, assets could be liquidated and those losses would be shared among the investors. And in fact, in terms of managing risk, this was always one of the big selling points uh, of CDFIs to investors is, is that your risk will be pooled uh, uh, with others and, and along with reserves and, and a strong balance sheet, We'll be able to ensure that you get repayment. More recently, we, we have programs that are actually insisting on specific reserved collateral, are not interested or willing to be part of a pool. They want a, a senior position. So for those of you who are thinking of joining the Federal Home Loan Bank uh, or have joined the Federal Home Loan Bank, you'll know that this is an issue. The Federal Home Loan Banks wants you to pledge uh, specific collateral in order to access their advance window. Uh, the CDFI bond as well wants explicit collateral pledged. And so the question is, how will these pledges affect other investors? That is, once other investors know that, that, that uh, certain investors get priority over them, will that have an effect on the field? And, and can CDFIs resist this? For a long time, uh, many CDFIs adopted the just say no policy. You know, there, there were times when maybe foundations wanted a priority and, and again would consistently argue and, and, and I'd recommend that to, to argue when people want a, a security specifically for their institution to say that you know, you're committed to a concept of, of sharing and, and equal seniority. 
but I fear, you know, this, this may be a, a losing battle, something we certainly want to keep our, our eye on. Uh, <clears throat> so in looking at some of the things I've talked about, a, a new model for CDFIs, the question I have up here is, is this whole idea of how can we better invest in collaboration and, and building infrastructure for the field as a whole. Uh, just uh, the other day, um, we were talking to uh, one of the uh, uh, online lenders, uh, uh, one of the uh, platform lenders, and, and, uh, and uh, they were saying that, that one of the issues that, that they really face right now is they don't understand CDFIs because you know, they're, they're all different. Uh, their, their pricing is different. Their, their products are different. Uh, their applications are different. Their credit box is different. And that there's very, what they say is we see very little collaboration in the field. So it's hard for us to meet a need in the field or think about broader collaboration because every deal seems to be a one-off. And so the question is, can we build more collaborative operating networks? This has already happened in the, in the banking field, uh, to some extent with credit unions as well, uh, where alliances of community banks uh, in which they have operating platforms where they share back rooms and, and, and servicing agreements and, and standardize all their documentation so they use the same thing, price so they can sell to a secondary market. In the, in the more conventional financial world, in, in order to compete with the, the, the larger institutions, we already see these collaborative operating networks being built, uh, where, where all everything from uh, applications to servicing is, is being centralized. In some instances, like lenders, one is a cooperative, that is, it's owned by its, uh, by its lenders, and, and any profits that, are, uh, that they get from the backroom activities or from, uh, 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 from the uh, collaborative work they carry on is shared by the members itself. And so the question is, what are the impediments to building infrastructure? Why, why, why don't we? Uh, cost is certainly one. Uh, you know, the idea of building a technology platform which serves needs is, is expensive. No one CDFI can take that on. Uh, and so what you need is a, a collaboration. In our most recent report to the CDFI fund, uh, we recommended and they adopted on a small scale this idea of an innovation or collaboration fund. And they put up a million dollars in the first round. Our, our recommendation was they put up $20 million because the idea is if you put up an innovation fund where you prioritized collaboration, you would get collaboration. CDFIs would come together. They would talk about how to build a small business lending platform that met their specific needs, where they could look at different uh, in investor types and where they could uh, uh, put together a, a proposal that would, that would meet their needs uh, uh, and, and address the, the, the cost issue. But we found there are also issues beyond cost, that is there are perception issues. And in talking to a number of CDFIs, we consistently got the response that we don't collaborate because we're unique. There, there's no one else quite like us. And although there's a kernel of truth to that, they're unique in terms of understanding their own specific market. The fact is that probably 80% of what CDFIs do, every other CDFI does. Yeah, you know, the backroom activities, the loan servicing, origination, documentation, there's a lot that's done in common. So there's a lot of room for collaboration, but often there's resistance to it, not just because of cost, because of perception that it wouldn't work. So what does a CDFI of the future look like? Well, in the CDFI of the future, you know, I could come into my office, I'd turn on my computer and it would uh, sign into the CDFI network. And it would allow me to do it, it essentially would be this operating system, any one of a number of things that I would wanna do much more easily. I could find investors for the tax credit of 2032. I could sell loans on the secondary market. I could develop a customized marketing campaign based on uh, uh, tools that have been put, been put together for the industry as a whole, but customized uh, uh, for me, I would uh, be able to contact my loan servicer. I could get advice from experts online for specific things. And so although we see pieces of this here and there, uh, ultimately the CDFI of the future has to, has to look different than the business model we have now. So how do we, how do we get there? Uh, 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 
Well, first of all, I'd say there's a lot of innovation going on in the field right now. The OFN conference is coming up next week, and that's probably the best place in the industry to find good examples of, of, of innovation. Every year, there are a number of workshops there that feature new ideas, uh, uh, new programs, uh, uh, new uh, uh, attempts at, at uh, policy on the local, state, and, and federal level. So there is a lot of the innovation going on. And the OFN conference is just one example where you see a, a, lot, of, uh, a lot of that uh, occurring. But there does have to be, we think, some sort of collective effort around some of the, these issues. Uh, how can we fund more on infrastructure? How do we encourage more collaboration? Uh, how do we get CDFIs to change their behaviors, particularly when we're looking at CDFIs where we have many that are relatively low performing, and if they want to stay in existence, are going to have to become part of more collaborative and cooperative models uh, if they want to continue serving the populations they serve uh, into the future. Um, so the winner is broccoli. We're coming back to that. And the winner is broccoli, meaning really, you know, like in farming, potatoes are a good idea, farming's a good idea, but ultimately to be successful, they needed to change not what they did, but essentially what they, how they did it, how they grew. And so our argument is that in the CDFI field, how do we take advantage of what's been a field that's demonstrated so much ability to do good, that has been evaluated and, and shown to do what it says it's going to do, to adapt to changes in technology, to adapt to uh, uh, changes in, in terms of uh, how to create efficiencies in terms of operations, in terms of attracting new types of investors by, by changing what our products look like. There are a lot of things that we need to do to change in order to make sure uh, that the model is maintained as a winning model. So I'm gonna stop here and ask if there are any uh, questions. Uh, I see there are a couple questions here. One is when you post this webinar on your website, could you link the report on the hospital community benefit? Uh, yes, it's right on there. We can link it with um, uh, the report that came out of the Financial Innovations Roundtable uh, this year. The current work that we're doing uh, probably be another year uh, because we're in the middle of that right now, but we will certainly post that uh, initial work that came out of Financial Innovations Roundtable. Uh, second question, the CDFI fund and other CDFI investors can drive change in the industry. Are there plans for the CDFI fund to require a set of standard metrics, for example, affordable units, affordability years, jobs created, jobs preserved, et cetera? Um, I don't really know. It, it was, uh, if you see in the most recent report we did for them that came out in March of this year, it was a recommendation that we made. We said, get together leaders in the field. There's been a lot of good thinking about, about metrics and, and uh, good ways of measuring that. I, what we said is, you know, there's some CDFIs do an excellent job right now. Others that have thought about this, you know, take about 15 to 20 CDFIs, put them in a room together uh, and tell them that, you know, they can't leave until they come up with a, a recommendation on, on, uh, on what would be a standardized set of metrics that they should measure for each of those different asset classes. And you would come up with a very good first draft of, of what they should measure. Uh, so we really think the CDFI fund should push to do this although they should be very careful to, in, in setting any metrics to make sure that these are metrics set by those who are doing the work in the field. Uh, so they should serve to convene rather than to dictate what those metrics uh, look like. Next question, if we use an analogy from banking, one solution for an underperforming bank is acquisition by another bank. What are your thoughts on mergers between CDFIs to get you to the larger scale you suggest? Uh, I think in many instances, a merger is a really good idea. Uh, you can't force it. There are several that are going on in the field now. I worked with a group of CDFI, three CDFIs in Connecticut that are in the final stages of a merger process. And ultimately, uh, uh, they decided to merge and their boards voted to merge because they felt they would simply be able to create efficiencies, serve more people better. Uh, so they felt they'd have an expanded market, more products, they would be able to do more good. There were a lot of issues they had to address. There was concern from the individual boards, would they lose their mission? And not to mention concerns about 
you know, who would be the CEO and, and uh, uh, you know, where would they be located and how would they deal with uh, those geographical issues. But I think we've seen some really good models of, of expansion and, and consolidation. Uh, uh, Self-help in, in Oakland helped uh, uh, a number of small non-performing uh, community development credit unions uh, come together as one and aggregate and, and be able to create great efficiencies and subsequently build their membership. So I, I, I think it's not always the solution, but, but frequently uh, uh, mergers can be very helpful in terms of getting better outcomes for the people and communities uh, that we serve. Just about to wrap up, uh, I don't have any questions. I just want to, for those who aren't familiar, mention uh, two other programs that we run. One is the our Master of Arts in Community Development Policy and Practice. This is a, a low residency program for adult practitioners. Uh, there's more information on our website. Again, you do a project in your community. You can earn your degree in as little as 14 months. You spend three beautiful weeks in New Hampshire in the summer. Uh, other work is done online and in your community. Uh, again, very applied work. Uh, uh, very specialized to people working in community development and uh, special elective options include work in community development finance. Uh, we work with Opportunity Finance Network, OFN, to offer a certificate in, in uh, community development finance. It's offered here in New Hampshire. Uh, we've offered it in the Southeast last year in collaboration with Self Help. We'll be doing it over the next year in, in Seattle as well as back in 2017 in North Carolina again. Uh, we feel that's a very a deep dive program. We've gotten practitioners from a number of CDFIs. If you don't know about this, please uh, look, look it up online. And uh, at the OFN conference next week, uh, both representatives from OFN, Beth Lipson and I will be available to talk to people who are interested. So thank you very much for joining uh, uh, the webinar today. If you do have follow-up questions that you didn't ask, please feel free to uh, Send me an email, be in, in, in touch with me. I'd be happy to try and, and answer your questions. Again, a lot of the data that I used in the presentation today is, is in much more detail in our written reports, which are available on our website. So I'd encourage you to take a look at those if you're interested. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Goodbye.